Section 6 of Fairy Tales from Goldlands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa S. Ware. Fairy Tales from Goldlands by May Wentworth. The Wishing Cap. Through the branches of a great almond tree sported the golden sunlight, till it fell in shining flecks upon the broad verandas of a spacious adobe house. Nothing could be pleasanter than this homestead in the southern gold land, with the great garden around it filled with all kinds of tropical flowers and fruits in their season. Here dwelt a little boy and girl, whose father and mother were both dead, so they poor children, had their sorrows. After the mother died, the father had married a poor widow, who had two children, about the age of his own little ones. At first, while the comfort of the new home was a novelty to the woman, she had been kind to the children. But, as the strangeness wore off, she began to feel like the real mistress. In a thousand ways she favored her own children, who were proud and selfish, and in all their childish differences only the motherless ones were punished. Then the father died, and the stepmother became like a great shadow between them and the bright sunshine of childhood. She would have sent them away from home, but their own mother had been very rich, and, after the father's death, the house in which they lived, the vineyard, and the large herd of cattle feeding upon the hills all belonged to them. The stepmother was very angry at this, but she was their guardian, so she managed everything to suit herself and lived in great ease and luxury. One day, as the children were playing in the garden, the stepmother's son threw his ball into a wild rose bush that was covered with thorns. "'Go and get it for me, Zoe,' he said sharply to the little girl. "'I cannot,' replied the child, for the thorns will tear my dress, and the signora will whip me. How dare you call my mother the signora? It is not from respect, but because you are a hateful little beast. And he struck the child a cruel blow, and made her go for the ball. Her dress was torn, and her pretty hands bleeding when she recovered it. Just then her own brother came up, and would have fought the unkind boy, but the little Zoe entreated, weeping, Dear brother, do not strike him. Come with me while I say, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. The heart of the young boy swelled with anger, and his quickened pulse beat fearfully, but, because he loved his sister, he suffered her to lead him away, for well he knew nothing would grieve her so much as his returning blow for blow. Oh, to be a man, he thought, as the hot tears filled his eyes. Why don't the years fly fast? How long must I wait before I can take care of my little sister like a man? Already the manhood was dawning in his heart, and if he could have protected the dear little maiden, he would have dared anything. At this moment the garden gate opened, and an old Indian woman came up the walk crying, strawberries fresh and ripe red and bright strawberries strawberries all the children ran to meet her and looked so eagerly at the pretty crimson fruit that she gave to each of them a handful but to the little sister who was so modest and beautiful she gave a small basket covered with green leaves and filled with the delicious berries when the other children would have taken the basket for themselves the old woman prevented them, and, while they went crying to their mother, Zoe hid her treasure under the trailing vines of a passion flower. "'Be quick, little senorita,' said the old Indian. "'Your mother once saved the life of my child, and an Indian never forgets. In the basket is a wonderful talisman, which will give you anything you want, just for the wishing.' She had hardly time to say this when the stepmother came out and bought all the fruit she had left. The signora was very angry with the orphans, and after whipping them both for quarrelling, she sent them supperless to bed in an old outhouse 
where the Indian servants slept, but she and her children sat down to a luxurious meal, with a large basket of delicious strawberries in the center of the table, plenty of nice white sugar, and three bowls of fresh, rich cream. For some time the lonely orphans lay talking of their own dear parents, and weeping as they lay shivering in each other's arms. The evening was coming on, and, though the days were very warm, there was a chill in the damp night air, and they had only a thin sheet to cover them. At last the brother said, Sister, I cannot endure it. If they would only whip me, but to see them strike you, I cannot endure it. You, whom I promised the dear Papa to love and protect, we have nothing but sorrow here. Let us go out into the wide world alone. It will not be so bad. At least we shall be away from the Signora, who gives only hard crusts to eat. Dear brother, let us go. The good God, who takes care of the pretty birds, will take care of us. But first, bring me my blue shawl, for it was the last thing the dear mamma gave me. Very softly the boy rose and went for the shawl, but the old Indian cook, who had lived in the family before he was born, and loved the children dearly, saw him and gave him some tortillas. The old wizened witch, to treat the real signora's children so, said the woman angrily. She, the signora, to be sure, a cane hut in the chaparral would be good enough for her. Goodbye, Mamie, said the boy, throwing his arms around the old Indian's neck. We are going away to seek our fortune, and when I am a man you shall live with us. But do not follow us now, or she will see you. We are running away from the signora, he whispered softly. The old Indian pressed him to her heart for a moment, and then said, Go, for nothing in the wild woods will hurt you so much as staying here. I shall go to-morrow, but I must wait and see that the old witch does not bring you back, for I believe she would kill you only for me. Then the boy went softly out, and the old Indian covered her face with her apron, and thought over her half-savage thoughts, which were still full of good faith and love to the children who had slept in her bosom in their helpless infancy. The little Zoe was waiting for her brother in the garden. As soon as she saw him, she held up the basket of strawberries, saying, This is all we have, but no doubt in the wide world God will give us all we need. The young boy wrapped the shawl about her, and, clasping each other's hands, they stole out of the garden silently. But when the gate had closed upon them, he told her how the old cook had given them the tortillas. That is but the beginning of our good fortune, answered the child. As they passed the lake of the Tuleis, the moon and stars were shining pleasantly, casting a flood of soft golden light upon the graves of the father and mother. Here the children stopped for a moment, and the little maiden laid her head upon the green grave of the mother, crying, Oh, mamma, mamma! We loved you so dearly, and are so lonely now. We are going out into the wide world alone, Mama, dear, sweet Mama. She buried her head in the long grass, and there would have wept herself to sleep, as she had often done before. But the brother took her by the hand, saying, We must hasten, sister, or the signora will come after us. So they ran on as fast as they could and every waving shrub or tree their fear and the darkness changed into the form of the angry stepmother. At last they came to a thick wood, and began to feel quite safe as they entered it. It seemed so large, and so far out into the wide world, that they were sure the stepmother could never find them there. The gray twilight of the morning was coming on, and— as they were very tired and hungry, they sat down under the trees to eat their tortillas and strawberries. In the bottom of the basket, Zoe found a nut, about the size of an almond. This must be the talisman that makes wishing having, said the little girl. They wished all sorts of things, but nothing came to them, and the boy said, It is a poor talisman. Throw it away. No, brother, 
answered the child. The old woman was so kind to me. For her sake, I will keep it always, and who knows what may come of it yet. So she wrapped it in a leaf and placed it in her bosom. Then they said their prayers, and, covering themselves with the shawl, they slept soundly till morning. When they awoke, the sun was shining through the leaves of a rich banana tree, and the ripe golden fruit was hanging in thick bunches just above their heads. See, brother, said the little girl, the good God has given us our breakfast. And they gathered from the ground as much of the delicious fruit as they wished. I am so thirsty, said the brother. I hear something that sounds like running water, replied Zoe. So they looked around until they found a brook with a clear spring of water bubbling up in the midst of the shining stones. I thank the good God for this pure, clean water, said the little girl, drinking with much pleasure, for she too was beginning to be very thirsty. We must go now, said the boy. They each took as many bananas as they could carry, and started to go, they knew not whither. They were light-hearted and happy in all their morning wanderings, but by noon they began to feel tired, hungry, and thirsty. I am sorry we left the beautiful shady banana tree and the brook. It is so hot, and I am very thirsty, said the boy sadly. So they both looked for water, but could find none. God will give us some by and by, said the little sister. Let us sit down and eat our dinner. They ate their bananas with sad hearts, and the wide world seemed very desolate. All around them the grass was withered, and the trees and shrubs were dying for want of water. Though they were so much fatigued and it was very warm, they were too thirsty to think of rest, and all the afternoon they wandered about looking for water and finding none. By and by the twilight came on, then the stars and the great golden moon shone upon the pale face of the children, glistening with tears. "'What shall we do, sister?' said the boy, weeping and falling upon the ground in despair. "'We shall die. We cannot be buried by the lake of the Tuleis with the dear papa and mamma. "'Do not cry, brother,' said the little Zoe, her own eyes filling with tears. "'I am sure God will help us.' and if he lets us die here, he will send the birds to cover us with leaves, as they did the poor little children in the woods. She put her arms around her brother's neck and kissed him, saying again, Do not cry, dear. God will help us. He is our Father who art in heaven. So they started again, and very soon they saw a tiny light shining through the trees and as they ran forward it grew brighter and clearer, and they heard a very pleasant sound, the rushing of waters. Taking heart again, they urged their little weary feet forward, till they came to a mill, and the clear light shone from the comfortable room in which sat the weary miller by a glowing fire while his young son prepared the supper. They knocked timidly at the door, and a rough, kind voice said, Come in. They entered and saw the miller sitting by the fire and his handsome young son spreading the table. The old man spoke to them, but they could not understand him, for he spoke in English and they were Spanish children. But the boy said in the soft Spanish tongue, My friends, who are you and where did you come from? The little girl answered, we are poor children, whose papa and mamma are dead, and God takes care of us. We are very hungry and thirsty, and he showed us the light shining from your window, so we are here. Then the boy gave them milk to drink, and put two more plates on the table, while he told the father what the children said. Bless her innocent heart, said the old man. God's little ones are welcome. He took the child in his arms and she nestled her head down in his rough neck and whispered, I love you. You seem like the dear papa. A tear came into the old man's eye. He only understood the word papa, but there was affection in the little arms that twined around his neck, 
and he kissed her, and said again, Bless her little heart. Her winning ways touched his affectionate nature. They made him think of a lonely grave and his own lost darling. Meanwhile, the boys talked pleasantly till supper was ready. Then they sat down together to a bountiful table, and the hungry children ate heartily and drank the pure sweet milk, which after their long thirst seemed delicious. After supper, they went to sleep on a nice deer skin spread upon the floor, but somehow that night the old man could not sleep. He got up two or three times to look at the children, with the tears standing in his eyes. He was living over the past. Bless her little heart, he said, smoothing with his rough hand the soft wavy hair of the little girl. In the morning the children woke much refreshed. At first they did not know where they were, but they saw the face of the old man turned kindly toward them, and remembered all. At breakfast the brother told their story to the boy, and he interpreted it to the father. They shall stay with us, said the old man, with great satisfaction, for he had dreaded parting with the child that had so won his love. After breakfast they went into the mill, and the handsome boy told the orphans his story in return. Some years ago, he said, my father and mother came to this country, bringing my little sister and myself. Mother and sister died very soon after we arrived, and father and I have lived here alone for many years. You can't tell how lonely it was at first, he continued, and how I used to cry myself to sleep, and poor father was very sad. I am so glad you are going to stay with us. God sent us, said the little girl, smiling, and the children were very contented and happy together. Thus they lived for many years at the old mill. The little Zoe grew to be a beautiful maiden, as good as fair. To the old father she was a great blessing, making his home always neat and pleasant. The two boys were handsome, strong young men, full of energy and life. Every day they roamed over the mountains prospecting for gold. The old mill was falling to decay and promised but little in the future. One evening, when they had returned after a hard day's work, weary and out of heart, they sat down on the stone steps of the old mill to rest themselves. The waters were flowing on with their usual pleasant music, and they were thinking and hoping for the future. When the household work was done, Zoe came out and sat by them. To amuse them, she told over the old story of the strawberries and the talisman that should make wishing having. "'Let me see the nut,' said the miller's son, and so he gave it to him. Placing it on the stone doorstep, he pressed his heel upon it, and the shell burst open, showing a silken cap of bright crimson, trimmed with cord and tassel of gold. They were all greatly surprised and the miller's son placed it upon Zoe's shining hair. "'How pretty it is!' said she. "'I wish I had a rose-bush filled with roses of the same color. She had hardly spoken before a rose-bush covered with beautiful crimson flowers sprang up at their feet. Then they knew that the pretty silken toy was a wonderful wishing cap, and that anything they might desire could be had for the wishing. In the morning, when the young men went out, Zoe put on the cap and wished they might find a mine of great richness. Though we could now live without the trouble of working, she said to the father, a rich mine would help hundreds of poor people who would find employment in it, so it would be a real blessing. While they sat talking, the brother rushed in, bringing a great nugget of gold telling how at last they had found a mine of fabulous richness. Thus they had everything they desired, till one day the miller's son put on the cap and told Zoe that above everything in the world he wished that she might love him and consent to be his wife. The young maiden blushed and begged for the cap. It was not quite fair, she said, in wishing that. So they talked, as young people will, but it ended in her placing her hand in his and promising to be his bride. And this 
as the father said, was the best wish of all. The brother was greatly pleased, and said, Zoe shall be married in the old home. So they all went together to the pleasant adobe house from which they had fled so long ago. The stepmother was greatly surprised to see them. She had so often reported them dead that she really began to believe it herself. She was obliged to give up everything to the true heirs. Thus she and her children became very poor again, though the brothers and sisters gave her a comfortable house and provided for her. She was very ungrateful. She was a disappointed woman, unhappy herself and making others so around her. It was a glorious day when the young people were married, and Zoe in her snow-white robes and rich lace veil was as fair a bride as the sun could shine upon. All the old friends of the family were invited to the wedding feast, and the old servants taken home again. Everyone was rejoiced to see the orphans enjoying their own, but of them all no one was so happy as the old miller, and when he kissed the bride after the ceremony he whispered, Bless your little heart, I could not live without my child. The young bride looked into his face with beaming eyes and answered only, My father. Thus they were all happy, and through the changing scenes of life, the goodness and faith of the wife and mother never failed. Like the little maid, Zoe, in the dark night, she trusted, and God always took care of them. End of Section 6 Recording by Lisa S. Ware Section 7 of Fairy Tales from Gold Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Fairy Tales from Gold Lands by Mae Wentworth. Crimson Tuft, Part 1. In the early days, many strange things happened. It was the mystical age of romance in the gold land, and people seemed to live years in months, or even weeks. Thus a great deal has been forgotten. In the old countries it was not so, and it may be that some are living even now at dear Bingen on the Rhine, who remember tenderly the handsome young couple who left their home to seek the alluring treasures of the gold land in the early days. They were honest peasants in the fatherland, but over the waters had floated the marvellous story how, in the glorious El Dorado, any one might become a lord of the soil or a rich minor prince. This it was that fired the heart of the father, and as the mother looked upon their boy, she was too ready to go out into the great world, though her heart lay fondly to the beloved fatherland. They had little money, but the thrifty good man managed to work for one and another on the passage, till, when he arrived at the young city of tents within the Golden Gate, he had cash enough to make a beginning in life. They were soon domesticated in a little shanty, and in a short time had prepared a fine garden, which became the good man's pride. Every morning Dame Waltenberger went to the market, where she had a stall, and sold fruit and vegetables for gold dust for that was the currency of the country in the early days. Her little son was ten years old, and a real delight to the mother's heart. He was well formed, with fine features, golden brown hair, and wonderfully expressive eyes. When he was calm and happy, they were of a soft looming blue, but if excited or angry, they grew dark and fierce, flashing like balls of fire. It pleased him, above all things, to assist the dear mother at the market, and very soon he displayed great taste in the arrangements of the fruits and vegetables. With maternal pride, the mother often told the neighbors it would be impossible to do without Paul, for really he was the greatest help to her. 
when the flowers were in blossom the boy always made them into bouquets and garlands while his pretty ways brought many a purchaser sometimes he used to carry home parcels for ladies who had made large purchases and very often he received presents from them with the regular customers the handsome little fellow was a great favourite one day as paul and the mother sat in the stall together talking of the dear fatherland so far away they saw a very queer-looking spanish woman approaching she seemed bowed down with age and infirmities and leaned heavily upon her staff as she hobbled along with the greatest difficulty after the spanish fashion her head was covered with a shawl from which peered her thin sharp face quite furrowed with wrinkles her bleared eyes were red and her long hooked nose nearly met her pointed chin altogether she was very unpleasant in her appearance all the time she kept her toothless mouth moving as she mumbled indistinctly to herself she came directly up to dame waltenberger's stall and entering it threw herself down upon the bench exclaiming this is what comes of growing old nothing but weariness care and aching of bones and she began rubbing her knees and muttering to herself little paul stood looking at her his eye dilated with wonder and the compassion of his heart made him blue as the cloudless sky ah exclaimed the old woman looking into his innocent face with a hideous grimace what are you staring at with your great round owl eyes do you think it's a fine thing to be old and lame and poor you will have to come to it ah yes there is a comfort in that old father time will take care of you yes 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 and she shook her long bony fingers and chuckled in such a horrible way that the child retreated behind the mother's chair and hid his face upon her protecting shoulder go quickly boy and bring me some fresh water said the old woman i am very thirsty she added looking at the mother little paul took a glass and ran away to the well and drew a bucket of water so clear and sparkling that it glistened in the sunlight like the dew of the morning as he carried it along he thought how the professor had told him of shining nectar that he be used to bear in the golden cup to jupiter and all the gods of olympus that was in the olden time he said but no nectar could be more beautiful and pure than the water the loving god in heaven gives to us all offering it to the old woman his open rosy face beaming with smiles he said it is nectar fit for the gods and i am your cup-bearer then he bowed so prettily that the mother laughed saying did one ever see such a child oh you mischief and she shook her fingers in the cunning old way that all mothers do the old woman took the glass but managed to spill half its contents over the child's clean clothes then she chuckled with delight at his discomfiture saying see what it is to be old my little cup-bearer while the mother wiped off the water with her handkerchief the woman began picking over the vegetables and fruit with her thin hooked fingers and smelling every bouquet of flowers till little paul's eyes grew dark and flashed like living flames just see her mother he whispered who will buy them after she has handled everything with her dirty hands and snuffed all the sweetness and beauty out of the flowers with her ugly crooked nose oh you little viper cried the old woman springing forward i'll teach you to mock at old age bell was too quick for her and had it not been for the mother she would have fallen in her eagerness to catch him never mind the child my good woman said dame waltenberger gently we were all children once now how can i serve you to be sure we were all children once ah me oh no i don't mind the child my little cup-bearer and the old woman drew her wizened face into a hundred wrinkles and began selecting a large quantity of fruits vegetables and herbs far more than she could carry is it far you have to go said the mother no no not far replied the woman so the mother called paul to help her he was very reluctant to go 
but when the mother kissed him and promised to make him a beautiful ball and cover it with red morocco he came forward and took the basket readily and i said the woman will give him a beautiful crimson tuft he will be gay as a lark my little cup-bearer this seemed delightful to paul and he followed after the old woman thinking i can play soldier with the crimson tuft and the professor in the next house will hear me and call me charlemagne it will be glorious to be the soldier with the crimson tuft little paul walked on in quite a lordly way with his great martial thoughts echoing in all the chambers of his boyish heart it will be glorious the soldier of the crimson tuft on on they went far out into the sand hills in an opposite direction from his own home paul's arm began to ache very much carrying the heavy basket but he was feeling so manly that he did not like to complain but at last he became so tired that it was no use he could not bear it any longer and great tears filled his eyes and covered his rosy cheeks all the way the old woman had been muttering to herself in spanish but paul could not understand that i am so tired he said resting the basket upon the ground oh it is not far not far and i will give you the bright crimson tuft think of that replied the old woman so paul took up the basket and again they went on a long long way and turned so many corners he feared he could never find his way back but still the thought of the crimson tuft allured him i must have it he said that would be a real pleasure at last when he was just ready to fall down with fatigue they came to a great iron-barred gate and the old woman rung the bell very loudly in a moment a great rough voice called in spanish as through a trumpet who rings at the gate very soon the gate was opened by a curious-looking dwarf who started and grinned fearfully when he saw paul the child offered him the basket but he only shook his head pointing after the old woman who gave him her staff and walked along with as much ease as little paul himself now the child was really frightened and would have run away but he was already within the gate and with a great clang it closed the dwarf put up the iron bars and replaced the bolts nothing could be more secure for all around rose an immense high fence topped with sharp spikes it was impossible to escape no one could get in or out a long avenue led to a pleasant-looking house built in the spanish fashion it was shaded with beautiful trees that had been brought from the southern country how they waved their long fan-like leaves in the sunshine it was a picture engraven upon the child's mind never to be effaced under the shadow of the trees walked the old woman toward the house and paul followed with the basket trembling like the light leaves of the tamarind just behind him came the dwarf he could hear his heavy tread it is no use no use thought the child but he would gladly have given the tempting crimson tuft the red morocco ball all all his pretty treasures to have been once more by the mother's side selling vegetables in the market they entered a large pleasant drawing-room with doors opening upon the front piazza and upon the veranda of the inner court so that though it was very warm a delicious breeze swept through the room and made it delightfully cool the old woman threw herself upon a couch and pointing to a silver bell told paul to ring it adding my little cup-bearer you must be tired and i will order something to refresh you before you return to your good mother i am not so very tired said paul let me go the mother will need me and he looked imploringly into the pitiless face that he was beginning to fear above all things bring the bell boy was the only answer so he rang the bell and the dwarf who had left him on the piazza entered the woman addressed him in spanish which paul did not understand but as he went to and from a large closet and began spreading the table he would turn his curious squinting eyes upon the child with looks of compassion in a short time all was ready and what a delicious lunch it might have been to the child but for the great fear that overshadowed him 
delicate cakes and confections cold chicken eggs and all kinds of fruits that children are so fond of with many nice-looking things that paul had never seen before there was a great pyramid of ice cream how i should like to eat it with a dear mother thought paul oh that was a delicious lunch to be sure come let us sit down said the old woman i am not hungry answered paul timidly for he longed so greatly to be at home that even these unaccustomed delicacies and the promised crimson tuft were as nothing compared with the sweet comfort at the dear mother's side you silly child you have walked all this distance carrying that great basket and are not hungry well you are thirsty and for your nectar of the gods i will return you the sherbet of an eastern prince the woman filled a glass with a clear rosy liquid that bubbled up and sparkled so temptingly that little paul who was quite overcome with fatigue and thirst grasped it eagerly and did not take the glass from his lips till he had drained it to the bottom then he wished to start for home but he felt so drowsy that he could not move he thought of the mother but felt no emotion and looked at the hideous old woman who was grinning horribly without fear in a few moments he sunk down upon the couch in a heavy sleep the woman stood over him chuckling in great glee i have you now my pretty cupbearer and will make you of great use to me i will teach you a thousand things you would be glad not to know you shall have it crimson tuft ha 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 i will teach you to be impertinent to me my hooked nose to be sure ah i am old old and nothing can make me young and fair if i could only take for myself your young beauty but no one day i must die and that will be the end the woman's face grew convulsed for she was haunted by the grim spectre death as with a dread terror her life had been so filled with darkness that she could not look forward to the calm hereafter all the brightness and beauty of heaven the golden was like the fleeting dreams of childhood that the rolling years bearing her to the portals of dim old age had swept away she had studied magic and tried to find the elixir of life but in vain she had discovered many wonderful things but not the fountain of perpetual youth nor the precious elixir of life for a few moments she stood gazing at the fresh face and rich curls of the child as he lay sleeping in his pure innocence once the word mother passed his rosy lips and the woman waved a perfumed fan over him so even the mother was no longer the companion of his dreamless sleep now it will do to begin said the old woman and she took from a secret drawer in the closet several bottles containing liquids and placed them on a little table taking a pair of sharp scissors she sat down by the child and cut off all his beautiful brown curls leaving only a little tuft this she made quite stiff in some way and coloured it bright red tying it upon the top of his head so that it stood up and looked very strangely there is the crimson tuft my little crab bearer she said laughing heartily at her wicked work then she tinged his eyebrows red and his skin a dark mahogany colour until instead of the beautiful little paul that every one had loved and admired he appeared the ugliest little wretch one could well imagine she took off his neat plain clothes dressing him in yellow leather breeches and a fantastic red jacket upon his feet she put shoes with long pointed toes that turned up and were tied with red ribbons when she had finished she looked at him with great satisfaction even the old dame herself would not know her cub now what an ugly little goat he has become to be sure and the old woman after her usual way muttered to herself at last she sat down and eating and drinking for by this time she was quite hungry every few moments she would stop and rub her long bony hands together and laugh as she looked at the transformed child paul slept all the afternoon and awoke in the dusky shadow of the twilight confused and bewildered 
to find himself in a strange room with the horrible woman sitting before a blazing fire gazing steadily into its fantastic pictures at first he could not tell where he was but in a moment he remembered all and jumped up in the greatest excitement saying how could i have slept when the dear mother was expecting me she will be so anxious oh let me go to her please good lady let me go what do you mean answered the old woman you have no mother you are my little servant crimson tuft i gave you that name myself on account of your red hair which stands up like a crest on the top of your ugly head then the child began to cry saying my hair is not red and my name is paul and it was my dear mother who sold you vegetables at the market this morning let me go home oh please let me go home to the dear mother the child's voice was broken with sobs but the hard-hearted woman only laughed ha ha it is a curious dream you have had or are you going crazy your hair not red indeed why look in the glass yourself she led him to a mirror and there the unhappy child saw reflected the ugly wretch called crimson tuft but never again the handsome little paul the child was more frightened and bewildered than ever he was sure he had left the mother that morning in company with this horrible old woman everything in the rude little home rose in his mind yet he could not realize his own identity paul surely he could not see in the reflecting mirror only the ugly little crimson tuft he raised his hands and took hold of the stiff shock of red hair that stood upright upon his head oh no it was not paul's soft silken curls yet there was a look about the eyes that reminded him of paul but even they were very different they were the red swollen terror-strained eyes of crimson tuft are you satisfied now said the old woman it was only a dream a queer dream that you have had crimson tuft and how funny that you should think you were an old vegetable woman's child you my servant who have never been out of this place in your life still the child only cried the more and entreated let me go home to the mother let me go home though he was faint from the effects of the narcotic and from fasting for a long time he refused food and continued to sob begging the old woman to let him go home but she only answered you are dreaming still or crazy then she told him how sometimes people were bewitched and did not know themselves still i am paul let me go at last the woman losing all patience called the dwarf to beat him if he did not stop crying and begin to eat so terror and hunger at last conquered and the little boy choking down his sobs sat upon a stool in silence to eat his supper very desolate and leaden-hearted from that day a new era commenced in the history of the child an era of servitude sorrow and tears that washed away so far into the past the memory of his free and joyous childhood that he began to believe what the woman so often told him that his mind had gone astray that he had been bewitched sometimes he would stand looking long into the great mirror at the stiff red hairs and brown skin of poor crimson tuft thinking what a beautiful myth it was about the happy little paul and the dear mother how it had stolen into his heart like a real life and still the signora as all about the house called her said it was only a bewildering dream into his eyes he would often look saying those are paul's eyes but the red brows give a different expression to their sadness he would add no no they are not paul's eyes always the red hair brown skin and sorrowful heart i must be only poor crimson tuft very often his hungry heart would cry out oh mother mother too often the shrill voice of the old woman would be the discordant answer sending him to some new task as months then years rolled by the child became more accustomed to his sorrowful lot and in many ways it grew pleasanter he learned to talk spanish fluently and became very fond of the queer-looking dwarf who had frightened him so much at first he often talked to him about his mysterious change but of these things the dwarf would never speak 
so at last Crimson Tuft ceased to mention them. His kind-hearted friend taught him many things in leisure hours, to read, write, and solve difficult problems, so that at twelve he was as much advanced in his studies as most boys of his age. With the signora he had become quite a favourite, although at first, for a long time, he had only menial service to perform. There came a change. One day she heard him reading aloud to the dwarf, and was so much delighted with his distinct enunciation and fine rendition of what happened to be a favourite author, that she called him to her private library, and talked a long time in a way she had never before addressed him. "'He is a boy of quick mind,' thought she, "'and may be more than an ordinary servant to me. "'He is just what I shall need in my troublesome Mexican affairs. "'I must train him to his work.' From that day, he used to sit hours in the library, reading to her, and often she gave him long papers to copy, which he was soon able to do, to her entire satisfaction. Very often she would talk to him as though he were a man. In fact, the training he was receiving brought only the man's thoughts. He had left his happy boyhood at the little stall in the marketplace. One day he found an old guitar in the attic of an outhouse, which was filled with broken furniture, and many things disused and forgotten. From that hour he enjoyed a real pleasure. In a short time he picked out the chords and wove them into delicious harmonies, and then there came into his mind a rich old melody of the fatherland. It was like the memory of a happy dream, and the tears filled his eyes. Again he was happy, for everything save the spell of the divine melody was forgotten. Two more years glided by, and the young boy was advancing towards manhood. He was tall and finely developed, and deep within his dreamy eyes slept a wonderful magnetic charm. Still the brown skin and stiff hair remained, and he was only poor ugly crimson tuft. In all his time he had never been outside the massive gate, which was always strongly locked and barred, and though he had often entreated the dwarf, the only reply was a grave shake of the head, and a sad compassionate look from the odd squinting of his companion, and if he persisted the dwarf would go away and leave him alone. End of section 7. Recording by phone. Section 8 of Fairy Tales from Gold Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Fairy Tales from Gold Lands by May Wentworth. Crimson Tuft Part 2. He had never ventured to speak to the signora but once, on the subject, in years, and then her fury was so unbounded that he feared she would tear him in pieces with her long bony fingers, which, when she was enraged, possessed the power of a vice. For a week after, she fed him on bread and water, and kept him confined in a dark room with two heavy tasks to allow him to question the mysterious past, or speculate on the uncertain future. Always a foolish dreamer, she said. I will teach you something, you, the brown-skinned crimson tuft. Yet it was all no use. The boy had his thoughts that could not be chained. He was determined to escape. I will not excite suspicion. I will strive to please. And the time will come, yes, the time will come, when I shall know all. Thus, in striving to lull the suspicions of the argus-eyed woman to sleep, he grew into great favour, and became indispensable to her. "'He can do so many things that no one else can do,' she would say to herself. "'But those great luminous eyes torment me. "'If they too could be changed, but that is beyond my power. "'Would I could make them dull leaden and red as his flaming crimson tuft!' He is useful, very useful, but there are times, with all his quiet seeming, when I think he suspects me. Dare I trust him? That is the question. Here the old woman would fall into long fits of musing, and gaze into the glowing embers, till they faded into dead ashes. 
one morning the old woman called crimson tuft to her saying i am going away to be gone for some days and i want you to copy these papers for me they are the deeds and other valuable papers of my property in mexico which you will see is very great let the copies be made with great distinctness for these duplicates may be required you see i am cautious and trust you very much very much a look of suspicion crossed her sharp wizened face but in the ugly brown countenance she could detect nothing but truth and sincerity i can do no better she thought but aloud she added the dwarf knows all and will see to the safety of these and everything if one of them is lost it would bring no end of trouble and you would have your share with an ominous shake of the head the old signora rose and left crimson tuft bending over the yellowed parchment that was of the most inestimable value to her about noon she left the house with the dwarf following her to the gate which when she had passed he barred more securely than ever for some days crimson tuft worked diligently over the papers there were deeds of haciendas and mines mortgages and grants of land and many long intricate pages of law papers really to copy all these was a task and crimson tuft was filled with amazement at the greatness of the old signora's possessions at last they were all finished and locked up by the dwarf in the iron-bound oaken chest and that again was locked in the great closet and the dwarf carried the key so it was very secure still the old signora did not return now the time has come thought crimson tuft i must escape but that was easier planned than done everywhere the dwarf followed him and when crimson tuft grew angry he laid his heavy hand upon his arm saying from the first i have loved you boy believe me it will all be well only wait a little longer then crimson tuft took his hard honest hand saying you alone have loved me and for your sake i will wait but not long i cannot do not ask it one evening about a week after this the bell rang and the signora entered followed by a most beautiful little maiden about twelve years of age she was dressed in mourning with a black shawl about her head her long glossy hair hung carelessly over her graceful shoulders her complexion was a clear olive and her skin soft and smooth as satin while her large dark eyes had a depth as of the mystic sea and a pure clear look as of heaven they were more beautiful than anything crimson tuft had ever seen and somehow they startled him it was not like the old vision yet it touched him more deeply this was of the present that of the past this is my only granddaughter said the old woman to the dwarf and crimson tuft both bowed very low to the pretty senorita they were such a queer-looking pair that she clapped her dainty little hands together laughing in a pure ringing tone clear as the notes of a silver bell poor crimson tuft was very much confused for to him the young donna leota was the first dream of beauty that had kindled the dawning fire of manhood in his heart and he was ready to bow down and kiss her footprints in the sand strange to say the little leota swayed the grandmother as absolutely as she had ruled the dwarf and crimson tuft but in one respect the old woman was resolute the heavy gate was locked as securely upon leota as upon the other inmates of the mansion and no persuasion could induce her to change in this regard leota was very passionately fond of music and played the harp very sweetly once in the still hours of night she was awakened by the notes of her own harp vibrating in the most exquisite harmony she was filled with delight though she trembled with fear for she was quite sure there was no one in the house who knew anything of music but herself yet the chords were swept as by a master's hand she lay motionless until the last note died away and it was long before she fell asleep for the spell of the rich melodies still floated through the air around her in the morning she spoke of it but no one could explain the mystery 
again and again in the silent hours came the rich melody not old familiar airs but the exquisite improvisations of genius one night when the golden moon was casting its soft amber light over land and sea and the enchanted harp sending forth its entrancing strains leota rose softly from her couch and summoning all her courage determined herself to solve the mystery she glided quietly along the passageway to the large glass door of the parlour and there she saw crimson tuft bending fondly over the harp and calling out the bewildering melody that she had thought could be born only of mystical enchantment the imagination of the young girl was so vivid that she was easily prepared for things supernatural but to see poor brown crimson tuft the great magician he the slave of whom she thought only to laugh at this was stranger than all the soft moonlight fell full upon his face and his large luminous eyes were dewy with the spirit of the rich melody with the rare beauty that was all their own they almost redeemed the brown skin and flaming hair from positive ugliness leota stood entranced till the last note died out of the thrilled chords of the thrumming harp then as she turned to go the rustling of her robe caused crimson tuft to raise his eyes and they fell full upon her face to him at least the most beautiful face in the world he was covered with deep confusion over his redeeming eyes fell the heavy red lashes and the ugly brows contracted she his rare divinity had seen him play and heard how the notes flowed from his own heart through the sympathizing harp strings that thrilled with his devotion to her which would last all his life long leota was greatly bewildered and as she stole away to her own room strange thoughts changed themselves through her mind not one word had been spoken but everything had changed crimson tuft was no longer only the ugly servant of her grandmother but he was crimson tuft of the mystery there was something interesting in that besides shut up in those high walls with only the old grandmother for company and little amusement one must think a great deal so leota had her thoughts crimson tuft had wonderful eyes she had found that out and it was a great deal there in that dull place she wished to be in mexico again where the most beautiful flowers bloom and the delicious fruit grows ripe on the broad-leafed trees yet she did not like to think she would never see the beautiful eyes again but one must not think too much of a servant she would say to herself she was of good blood and that would not do yet one must treat inferiors kindly really it was difficult to tell what one must do so all in a maze she fell asleep and dreamed of the most radiant eyes which were crimson tufts and the handsomest face but surely was not crimson tufts the morning dawned clear and bright as crimson tuft arose and began the duties of the day though he was advanced to the post of private secretary the old signora had left him some tasks in the early part of the day that would prevent him from forgetting his position as a servant first he swept and dusted the parlour and halls this had always been his work and no one else could please the signora so well as he dusted the signorita's harp a flash of indignation filled his heart he was only a servant the ugly crimson tuft and she the most beautiful maiden the divinity of his soul there was a great difference yet he felt himself a man and he would conquer fate in the end even with his ugly crimson tuft this was what he thought when leota appeared she said nothing of her discovery but when she spoke to him it was in a different tone from formerly the mystery of the enchanted harp was over but the greater mystery had begun the wonderful eyes acted as a talisman upon her heart and though she strove against it she found herself forgetting crimson tuft's position his ugly brown skin and red hair one glance of his beaming eyes would set her warm blood dancing through her veins till her neck and brow were a soft rose tint and this was in no way pleasant to the proud little maiden 
the next night crimson tuft did not touch the harp and in the morning the donna leota passed him at his work with a haughty toss of her dainty head but with a quiver in her voice she said crimson tuft play when you like the music pleases me after that crimson tuft would always play at twilight and even the old grandmother was touched by the magical spell of his genius every year the old woman grew more infirm till she could not even walk from room to room without leaning upon her staff at times her temper was terrible and nothing but the soft touch of leota's hand could calm her she loved with all her strong heart nature the young maiden who daily was growing to womanhood crowned with surpassing beauty she was getting very old with an iron will she resisted the pitiless hand of time but she could not stay it her long hands became more bony and angular her eyes more red and bleared and her voice more cracked and shrill yet she seemed to be looking forward to a long life and was more hard and grasping than ever it was only leota that she loved more than gold one night crimson tuft had a curious dream he thought as he lay half sleeping and half waking dreaming delightful but impossible things that the old woman came in softly and poured something upon his head and that when he started she held a sponge to his nose until he sank back powerless he seemed to inhale something sweet and fragrant it was very pleasant and soothing that was all he could remember in the morning he felt heavy and drowsy his head ached but he roused himself rose and dressed as usual when he looked in the glass he saw that his hair was redder and his skin a deeper brown than ever memories and a strange suspicion flashed over his mind far back in the years he remembered dimly a little boy named paul a fair child whom he had been taught to believe a dream there was a mystery could she have changed paul to crimson tuft in a night after this crimson tuft became more thoughtful than ever there was a mystery to solve and he would devote all his energies to it he was eighteen years old a very intelligent young man but entirely unacquainted with the world he had yet much to learn one day the old woman called him to her and looked in her curious way at him for a long time crimson tuft she said you are my servant but i have given you great advantages so that you are as well educated as many a rich man's son but that is not all i wish to make your fortune then the old woman fell into a deep study and crimson tuft stood waiting and wondering what would come next at length you grew tired signora he said you wanted to speak with me she gave a sudden start as he spoke oh yes she replied but i had forgotten you you are my servant and have been so always always asked crimson tuft a dark frown passed over the old woman's face and crimson tuft regretted his folly he was very anxious to hear what she had to say to him there might be some hope of relief but again she was silent and worse than all she seemed displeased the donna leota passed the open window singing lightly a pretty spanish air and the shadows began to clear away from the clouded brow excuse me signora said crimson tuft softly if in some way i can serve you i shall be only too happy he too had heard the soothing song crimson tuft she replied i am not now so strong as i was twenty good years ago and i want someone near me whom i can trust for i have affairs that must be attended to now someone who will not cheat me out of my gold i have looked carefully about and can see no one but you you whom i have trained educated and cared for so many years the world is so ungrateful and wicked even you who owe everything to me might rob me me an old woman it would be a wicked thing a great crime the red eager eyes of the old woman were fastened upon the face of the young man and with all her shrewdness she tried to read him 
her pinched features grew sharper and her voice shrill as a whistling wind she grasped her staff and hobbled across the room several times in an excited manner you are such a curious ugly fellow what have you to hope for in the world save from me but if you are faithful i will advance you but i can as easily punish as reward the red blood flushed even the brown cheek of the boy for he was painfully conscious of his extreme ugliness and he thought sadly of the donna leota listen boy continued the old woman there is a great world beyond these walls can i trust you to go away over the waters with me remember all i promise you and be faithful she looked steadfastly into the luminous eyes of crimson tuft that dilated with pleasurable exultation she was evidently satisfied with the truth and sincerity she saw beaming there for she proceeded i must go again to mexico but not alone the donna leota will accompany me for in the years to come i cannot be separated from her and you must go as i shall need you i am very rich and must trust you with a great secret but i have studied you well signora said crimson tuft eagerly i will be true to you you shall never regret swear it she said fiercely so the young boy knelt and pressed the good buck to his lips repeating after her a most solemn oath to serve her faithfully and keep sacred the great secret which was to be revealed to leota only in case of the grandmother's death now she said i am weary to-morrow i will tell you all and she leaned back in the armchair and shaded her eyes with her fan crimson tuft went out with his heart beating wild in a tumult of conflicting emotions on the morrow again she called him to the library and locked the door i have made my will she said and you are handsomely provided for in consideration of your proving faithful to the trust i repose in you besides this while i live you shall never want for gold is it all fully understood then crimson tuft said it is understood signora fully and she took from her desk a carefully sealed paper which she wrapped in sheepskin and again sealing it gave it to the boy this paper she said describes the exact spot where a great treasure is hidden upon my hacienda near the city of mexico there is no chance of your gaining this for yourself for there are two other persons living who have similar papers indeed precautions that i shall not tell you of have been taken so that it must fall to the donna leota at last for she is the only true heiress you see i am cautious very cautious she added the old look of suspicion rising in her face from this day crimson tuft was her chief adviser he and the dwarf made all preparations for the journey in about a week all was ready and they went to san francisco in a carriage which drove immediately down to the steamer and they were soon comfortably settled on board now said crimson tuft there is still time and i can walk about the city for half an hour but the signora grew excited and exclaimed no no you might get lost remember you are a stranger and the donna leota said softly surely you will not go away so the dwarf performed all the commissions and for an hour the signora was absent but before leaving she had said to crimson tuft i leave the donna leota in your care at length the ship sailed then came the long sluggish dreamy days at sea crimson tuft and leota were often together upon the deck for the old signora would not allow her there alone what golden days they were to the poor crimson tuft more and more he was growing to love the pretty young signorita and she could not resist the powerful spell of his luminous eyes one night she rushed wildly through the saloon to his stateroom the grandmother had been taken suddenly very ill and must see crimson tuft she breathed with great difficulty and her words came low and broken 
if i live to reach mexico you will not need this paper but i am old she added bitterly and the old must die with great pain she went on if i should not live to reach the hacienda you will see the child has her own dig up the treasure yourself and do not defraud her of one single gold piece or the curse of a dying woman will follow you even from the darkness of the grave then again crimson tuft promised and taking the paper left her alone with the child as she still fondly called the donna leota this attack passed away but another soon followed and again crimson tuft was summoned to her side her glazed eye brightened as she saw him remember was all she could say and again he made the solemn promise it was the third and last time with the old signora all was now over leota trembled with fear and wept bitterly the grandmother had loved her and now there was no one left only crimson tuft who sat by her side all through the silent hours the next evening at sunset the old signora was buried in the sea no one wept but the beautiful young maiden as the steamer went on leaving in its wake the cold lifeless body wrapped in a shroud of sparkling waters at length the good ship arrived safely in mexico and crimson tuft took the proud young heiress to the hacienda where a crowd of friends and retainers awaited her the will was opened and there was a large legacy left to crimson tuft but it was as nothing to him with so much ugliness what had he to hope for in the last paper the signora had handed him there was a still fuller description of the spot where the treasure was hidden and a night appointed for him to seek it it was the eighteenth birthday of the donna leota till then she was to be placed in a convent and crimson tuft was to have the best tutors in the city of mexico this would make a man of him so the young people were separated for a time but the two years soon rolled by and crimson tuft returned to the hacienda with his papers what a change there was in him his brown dark face had grown every day more fair and his stiff red hair more soft and silky and of a rich brown colour it was really wonderful the young man was transformed day by day from the ugly crimson tuft to the handsome pole the donna leota had become the beautiful woman that her childhood promised and when she met paul after the two years of separation she felt that the great mystery was solved and knew that she could never love any one else so they were betrothed and she was to be made his wife on her eighteenth birthday at the appointed time paul sought and found the great treasure that had been hidden for so long there were immense iron pots full of shining gold pieces that had been hidden during one of the many mexican revolutions thus it was found that the donna leota was the richest maiden in all mexico and she had many suitors among the wealthy spanish hidalgos but she cared only for paul for the spell of the wonderful eyes which had been crimson tufts was upon her at last the joyous wedding day came and every one said what a tall handsome signor is the bridegroom and how very lovely the bride the sun shines upon them and it will be a happy marriage soon after they went to san francisco and paul felt the old dream returning one day as he walked through the market-place he came to a vegetable stand behind it sat a sorrowful woman with a sad mild face that woke the sleeping memories of his heart mother he exclaimed with a thrill of tenderness in his voice that raised the bowed head of the lonely one she gave one look into the eyes that once seen could never be forgotten and cried paul my son my son and opening her arms received upon her bosom the head of her long-lost treasure how she wept and smiled and pressed him to her heart then held him off that she might gaze upon the dear handsome face then they went home to the father who was old and sick he had lost strength and heart years ago and they were very poor he has never held up his head so the mother said 
since our boy was taken from us but that was all over the lost was found poverty sorrow and sickness fled with his presence he took the old father and mother home to leota who received him into her own heart for were they not his parents and hers at first the old vegetable woman stood a little in awe of her high-born daughter but that soon melted away in the warmth of her dainty little signora's affection and the father mother son and daughter lived all their lives together a happy family united in heart and mind by the silken bonds of a true earnest affection End of section 8. Recording by phone. Section 8 of Fairy Tales from Goldlands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emily Bitterman, Denver, Colorado. Fairy Tales from Goldlands by May Wentworth Snowdrop and Rosebud Years ago, before the gold seekers came to California, there lived at the mission of San Gabriel a Spaniard, whose beautiful vineyard was admired by all the country. In early life he had been a great traveler, and while in Germany he met a fair golden-haired maiden, whom he loved and married. After a few years, he emigrated to America, and settled at the mission of San Gabriel, near the town of Los Angeles. There he prospered greatly. His cattle increased to great herds, covering the green hillsides, and his vineyard was the pride of his heart. He built a pleasant house, and surrounded it with a garden filled with all kinds of fruit. In that delicious climate, fruits of the tropic and temperate zones grow together, while the white flowers of the north and their crimson-hued sisters of the south blossom side by side. There seemed nothing wanting to make his happiness complete but children. The house was too silent. He wished for the silvery laughter of childish voices. He longed to press little ones to his heart and call them his own. At last, God gave him two little girls, but the fair, golden-haired mother lived only to bless them and was then buried by the clear Lake of the Toulouse. At first he was inconsolable, and for months refused to see his little ones. But one day, while he slept, the old Indian nurse took them into his room and laid them on the bed by his side. Little Snowdrop nestled in his bosom, but Rosebud ran her fingers into his beard and pulled it so hard that she woke him. There she was, when he opened his eyes, crowing with delight, her little rosy lips close to his, and the fair snowdrop in his bosom. Then all the father's love, which had only slept, awoke, and he pressed the little ones to his heart, weeping. But especially he loved the beautiful snowdrop. She was so like her mother. After this, although he still mourned greatly for his wife, he loved these little ones very dearly, and as years passed by, became happy in the absorbing devotion to them, which filled his whole heart. He watched over them with the most jealous care. Even in childhood, he would not allow them to play with other children, and as they grew, his fear was awakened, lest some of the young seniors of Los Angeles should see and fall in love with them. For his daughters to form a mesalliance, he was quite sure would break his heart. As he was obliged often to go from home on business, he employed an old Indian woman as duenna, and charged her never to allow the girls out of her sight for a moment. Rosebud was a Spanish girl, with purple-tinged hair, soft black eyes, and clear olive complexion. Through the satin skin, the warm blood flushed her cheeks and her lips were more tempting than ripe cherries. But Snowdrop was a rare German maiden in complexion, clear and fair as the noonday. Her eyes were like violets, her hair in the sunshine was like fine-spun gold, and so long that it reached to her feet, and hung like a mantle of glory about her. 
it was no wonder the old man guarded his daughter so carefully. For though so different, they were equally beautiful, and all the young men of good family were anxious to pay court to them. Day by day they sat upon the piazza of the inner court, reading the fascinating romances of old Spain, which was to them the dreamland of delight. They longed very much to go out and see something of life among the rich Spanish families about San Gabriel and Los Angeles. But their father would not allow it, and the old duena was always near them, even when they walked through the vineyard or the orange orchard. She followed them. One day, Rosebud called Snowdrop into the garden, and sitting under a large almond tree, she said, Look over this book of prints with me, while we talk softly, for the duena must not hear everything. Snowdrop rested her golden tresses upon her sister's arm, and turning over the leaves of the book, they talked together. Sister, dear, said Rosebud, we lead a very dull life here. All young girls are gay and happy. What is the use of being beautiful when no one to see us but servants and old women? A look of conscious beauty gathered around her pouting lips as she ran her dainty fingers through the silken meshes of her sister's golden hair. Arthur Papa loves us, said Snowdrop. But I do wish to be loved by others, she added, her violet eyes softening and a faint flush spreading over her fair cheeks and neck. "'And I to be admired, but how can we be either?' replied Rosebud. "'Shut up here with the old duena to watch everything we do. God made us beautiful, and I'm sure he intended us to be seen. And for my part, I am determined to go to the consul's grand ball if I have to run away.' And her pretty dark eyes filled with tears." Oh, Sister Rosebud, think of the dear Papa, said Snowdrop. He did not tell us not to go out of the garden alone. He only told the duena to watch us. If we could only manage her, said Rosebud thoughtfully. I am afraid that would not be right, replied Snowdrop. But I want to go very much. We will make an altar cloth and embroider it with gold as an offering to the Blessed Virgin. Perhaps she will pity our loneliness and help us. So they wrought an altar cloth of purple and gold, and spread it upon the altar before the picture of the Blessed Mother in their own chamber, putting vases of beautiful flowers upon it. When it was finished, they were quite happy, and sat down with their guitars and sang very sweetly together till their father came home. The next morning... An old Mexican woman, with baskets of trinkets for sale, knocked at the garden gate. When she was admitted, she spread out her finery before the young senoritas. The duena hastened to the piazza where they were sitting, for no one was more fond of looking over the vendedora's basket than she, always finding something she could not do without among its tempting stores. This time it was a gay-colored shawl, and she ran away for her purse. As soon as she was out of sight, the old woman whispered, Pretty senoritas, I have charms to sell. This will make you admired, and this loved, she said, holding up two curious little bags, one tied with long pink ribbon, the other with blue. And this, pointing to a third, will make you sleep. It contains a powder. You must drop one grain into a glass of water. It is perfectly tasteless, but it brings on a sleep so profound that until the effect passes away, nothing could awaken you from pleasant dreams. The young girls bought the charms. Snowdrop took the one tied with the blue ribbon and placing it on her bosom whispered, Now I may be loved. And I will be admired, said Rosebud, taking the other. But the charm for sleep she concealed in her pocket just as the old duena returned, eager for her purchases. "'I have pretty slippers for a little dancing feet,' said the old woman, holding up two pairs of the daintiest white satin slippers you could imagine. "'The senoritas have no use for them,' exclaimed the duena, frowning. But the young girls found they fitted so nicely and looked so pretty they bought them. 
Papa is rich enough to give us anything we want, and we fancy these, said Rosebud. They bought strings of beads, ribbons, and combs for their hair, until the old duenna was nearly frantic. What they could want with all of these, shut up as they were, she could not tell. Then Rosebud said, We will have some new dresses. So they bought fine white muslin and lace. Snowdrop bought a bright colored handkerchief, which she gave to the duenna, who was so much pleased that she promised to help them make their dresses. As soon as the old woman went away, they all sat upon the piazza, shaded with vines, and commenced cutting and stitching upon the delicate fabric so busily that by evening the skirts of their dresses were quite finished. The next morning they were early at work again. "'Why do you hurry so much?' said the duenna, who never liked to work very long at a time. "'To have it over sooner, duenna,' answered Snowdrop, smiling so sweetly that the duenna took her needle again quite pleasantly. Snowdrop's dress was trimmed with blue ribbon, rosebuds with crimson and gold. The young girls wrought upon them all their pretty fancies, till, when they were finished, the duenna thought them beautiful enough for a queen. At evening, the work was all done, and the duenna, quite fatigued with her unaccustomed task, sat dozing in her armchair. Suddenly she roused herself, exclaiming, "'How warm it is! I am very thirsty!' Rosebud jumped up quickly, saying, "'I will bring you fresh water.' So she ran down to the spring at the foot of the garden, and there she met the faithful old Miguel, who had been in the family for years, before she was born, and loved the young senoritas as though they were his own children. Rosebud caught him by the arm and whispered, "'Have the horses at the back garden gate tonight at nine o'clock, you dear old Miguel, for you shall take us to the consul's ball.' "'But the senor," said the old servant in astonishment, "'never mind the senor, you dear careful man. "'But the duena,' he continued. "'Never mind, never mind. "'I tell you I will go, so be sure you are ready in time.' said Rosebud, laughing and shaking her finger as she ran away. Poor Miguel was in a great dilemma. He loved the pretty senoritas and wanted to help them, but he feared the senor. It may cost me my place, and in this family I have lived, and here I would die. But my pretty children are so lonely. It is too bad to shut them up, and old Miguel will not fail them. Thus his fond love for the fair girls he had carried in his arms in their helpless infancy conquered his discretion, and he went to the stable to groom the horses. Rosebud brought the water, clear, cool, and sparkling, to the old duenna, and she drank it eagerly in her thirst, little dreaming of the sleep charm the gay young senorita had placed into the cup. Almost instantly she became very drowsy, and, closing her eyes, she fell asleep in her chair. In the short time, her heavy breathing told how surely the charm had taken effect. "'Now for the ball,' said Rosebud. So the young girls dressed themselves quickly, but with great care, looping their sleeves with rare flowers from the garden and tying their ribbons very tastefully. "'I think we shall do,' said Rosebud, looking at the beautiful girl reflected from her mirror, then at the softer beauty of her sister." Snowdrop answered by a kiss, and they went out softly and down the garden path to the gate, where the faithful Miguel waited for them. An hour's ride brought them to the brilliantly lidded mansion of the consul, and all the young seniors were delighted at the arrival of the fair sisters. No one was so much courted and admired among all the fair senoritas at the ball that night as Snowdrop and Rosebud and none of the gay hidalgos were more happy than old miguel who was peeping from behind the hall door enjoying the triumph of his darlings at last he became uneasy and approaching them with a respectful bow told them it was time to go home taking special leave of their host and hostess bowing gracefully to the guests they started for home leaving all admirers and many lovers behind them when they entered their chamber they found the duenna still sleeping soundly. They undressed themselves noiselessly, putting away all their clothes but their slippers, which they forgot. In the morning, when the sun arose, 
the duenna awoke and was much surprised to find herself sitting in a chair instead of being in bed she had but a confused recollection of things and began to think she must have taken a little more wine than she intended at dinner the day before she thought she remembered rosebud giving her a glass of water when she was very thirsty but she was not sure that it might not have been wine she looked around but could discover nothing to help her the two girls were sleeping soundly and upon the face of rosebud was a smile she was dreaming of the ball again surrounded by the crowd of admirers snowdrop dreamed of the dear papa he was angry with them for their disobedience and her long eyelashes were wet with tears how different they are in their ways even in sleep said the duenna she turned away and as her eye fell upon the forgotten slippers her searching glance detected that they had been worn what does this mean so much worn and bought yesterday tis very strange mused she and put them in her pocket she woke the young girls, but they fell asleep again. They were so unused to dancing late at night that they were very tired, and when the bell rang for breakfast, they did not appear. "'Where are my daughters?' said the father, with a clouded face. She could only tell him that they were still asleep and seemed very tired. "'So are my horses,' replied he angrily. "'But I will see about this.' The duenna was afraid to show him the shoes, lest he should blame her. But in her confusion, as she drew her handkerchief from her pocket, one of them dropped out upon the floor. "'What is this?' said the signor sternly, and she was obliged to tell him all she knew. For some time, the troubled father walked the floor with great agitation without speaking, while the duenna stood trembling before him. Then, turning to her quickly, he said, Call my daughters, and he rang the bell for Miguel. All three came into the room with fearful hearts, but Snowdrop's face was covered with her golden hair, and the tears were shining through it. Turning to Miguel, he said sternly, with a black frown covering his whole face, Stand here and tell me how it is that this morning I find my horses reeking with foam. The old man answered, I alone am to blame, senor. "'Pardon your old servant who loves you and yours.' "'And he clasped his hands and looked imploringly at the dark, angry face that frowned upon him. "'Then Snowdrop could bear it no longer. "'So she ran to the father, throwing her white arms around his neck, "'and resting her golden-crowned head upon his bosom, she said, "'Dear Papa, I will tell you all, only do not blame dear good old Miguel.' Then she told him of all their loneliness and eager longings for companions of their own age, about the altar cloth and all, without reserving one thing. And now we are sorry. It was wrong, but dear Papa will forgive. And she raised her pretty face, all shining with tears, and begged him to kiss her. How like her mother she was! And the father thought of the sunny days of his youth, when he had wandered on the banks of the Rhine with the fair German maiden, and wondered how he could forget the young and ardent hearts of his children must be like the heart of his youth. He kissed the innocent face upturned to his, and forgave them, saying, I, too, have been to blame, and, in future, I will go with you to all places, my darlings, where it is proper and right for you to go. Snowdrop and Rosebud were delighted, and willingly promised never again to deceive the dear papa, and from that day there was mutual confidence and love between the young girls and the father. After a time, when two brave and gallant knights sought of the father the hands of the fair senoritas in marriage, he answered, Let the hearts of my dear children decide for you. My only wish is to see them happy. There was a great feast made at their marriage, and the old Spanish house, so long wrapped in seclusion, resounded with joyous music and the merry laughter of light hearts. Again, old Miguel stood behind the door and rejoiced to see his darlings loved, admired, and happy. End of Section 8 
Section 10 of Fairy Tales from Gold Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mariah Martin Sheen. Fairy Tales from Gold Lands by May Wentworth. Lazarus and Bummer. It was a dark, rainy day in the land where the rain makes the winter, and the sunshine and blue sky the pleasant summer-time. Through the golden gate came the ship to the new city of Hope, and all the people on board thought, How happy and rich we shall become in the gold land! Though the city is now only a miserable place of tents and sand-hills, one day how great it will be, and we shall live to see it, the fair golden city. On the rude wharf stood the expectant crowd. To them the ship was the beautiful carrier dove, with its white wings spread to bring them news of home. "'Perhaps there will be someone from the old home,' said a young man, with his brown eyes filled with eager longing. The dark old Atlantic! How its breakers used to dash upon the rocks in sight of home! It was glorious! Tomorrow will be Christmas! I wonder— Will they remember all as I do? By his side stood a great shaggy dog, who belonged to nobody. He talked only in the dog language, but was very learned, and understood all the young man said. He was a wonderful dog, and had his thoughts. I am my own master, he said, and that is pleasant. Yet one likes to be cared for, and nobody cares for me. I shall get no news from home, and to-morrow will be Christmas. This is not as it should be. I must see to it. The great dog was getting quite out of temper, and with a surly growl he turned round so quickly that he gave the young man a start. One would think the dog was mad, said he. Only it is not the season. Then he looked out again, hopefully, to the coming ship. The great dog ran round the corner and through the wet streets all day. The steamer had arrived, and there were new faces looking eagerly about for old familiar ones, and the old were looking for the new, so there was altogether a great bustle such as was never seen only in those early days when the ships came in from home. Thus the day passed, and the evening came on, raining dismally. Yet it was Christmas Eve. In a dark alley sat the great dog. His shaggy coat kept him warm, yet it was very desolate there alone. "'One should have something to live for,' growled he. "'Something to take care of and protect, or there is no use in being strong and brave. One might as well be a puny poodle and sit by the parlour fire.' And he gave an ugly bark. "'Bow, wow, wow!' One should have an object in life. Just then he heard a low moan, and looking round he saw a poor lame dog, very thin and sick, lying down in the mud and ready to die of hunger. It was really quite wretched, and all the great dog's sympathies were aroused. "'There is an object, to be sure,' he said. "'It is Christmas Eve, and the good Santa Claus has taken pity on me and given me this poor fellow who needs me as much as I do him. What a zest life has, when one has something to live for! Without any useless ceremony he raised the poor dog, and tenderly as the mother dog carries her little ones, he bore him to a warm, dry place, and made him a nice bed of clean straw. "'This is better, my friend,' said the noble creature quite flushed and happy with the pleasure of doing a kind act. "'What more can I do for you?' "'I am famishing with hunger,' replied the lame dog, with a feeble groan, and off went his great shaggy protector, through rain and mud, to a restaurant, and there the cook gave him a bone, saying, "'Take it, you bummer!' He caught the bone, and running off as fast as possible, in a few moments laid it before the lame dog. 
It was a rich bone, and had a delicious smell that was quite reviving to the sick one. It was so pleasant to see the poor hungry fellow eat that Bummer could not leave him until he had finished. "'I never enjoyed a bone so much in my life,' said Bummer, as he tucked the warm straw around his new friend, and saw him closing his eyes with a pleasant, satisfied languor. "'This is something like living,' added he, with a lively bark, as he ran back to the restaurant for his own dinner. "'Coming again, Bummer?' said the jolly, red-faced cook, throwing him another bone, which he ate with a famous relish. In the morning he went back again to the restaurant, serving the sick dog first, and again at night, and day after day, till he became the jolly cook's regular pensioner. At the restaurant they grew quite curious to know what became of the first bone, and sent someone to follow Bummer, who came back telling the strange story, and saying, "'It is really quite wonderful!' Then everyone talked of it, and soon the whole town came to know the two dogs, and called them Bummer and Lazarus. In the pleasant days they walked out together, Bummer always watching over Lazarus with the tenderest care. It was really a pleasant sight to see them. They were so happy together. Thus time passed away, making no change in the protecting devotion of Bummer, nor the trusting love of Lazarus. But there must be an end of all things, and at last Lazarus died. This was a great sorrow to poor Bummer, and he grew so thin and wretched that the jolly cook was quite distressed. "'You must cheer up, my good Bummer. Really, it will never do. You must cheer up.' "'It is all over now,' said the dog. "'One must have something to live for. It is no use. One must have an object.' He was no longer the Bummer of old and he went away to the place where Lazarus rested. "'He forgot to eat his bone,' said the jolly cook. "'Poor fellow! We were getting used to him, and we shall miss him. He belonged to the town. He was our dog.' This was the last time he went for his bone. It was all over, and Bummer and Lazarus became a remembrance which has passed into a tradition." The skin of Bummer was carefully stuffed and placed in a glass case. It may still be seen in some restaurant on Montgomery Street, where it is preserved as a precious relic of the olden time. This is a true story, little ones, and no doubt the fathers will tell you how, in the olden days, he has often seen Bummer and Lazarus. End of section 10 Recording by Mariah Martin Sheen. End of Fairy Tales from Gold Lands by May Wentworth.